This lesson deals with lab number two, Thevenin and resistance. In ECE 201 and 202, we show that any linear circuit could be represented by a Thevenin equivalent. The same is true for our instruments, except that the Thevenin voltage is usually zero. So what happens when you hook up a circuit with an instrument? Well, you can see here we have a series combination of our R Thevenin with Z Thevenin, so we could use our voltage divider rule to solve for the voltage across the face of our instrument. And that's gonna be equal to V Thevenin times Z in over Z in plus R Thevenin. Now, if we make Z in much, much greater than R Thevenin, then this term drops out, and V out equals V Thevenin. Therefore, our instrument didn't affect the value of the voltage that we're trying to measure. Now, what kinds of Z ins do we have? Let's we'll take a look at the oscilloscope first. There are two modes we're gonna be operating the oscilloscope. One's called a DC mode and an AC mode. The DC stands for direct coupling, which is just that. We're just gonna directly connect our circuit to the oscilloscope. The feminine equivalent circuit looking in here is an R in and parallel with a C in, where R in can be either one mega ohm or 50 ohms by just pushing a button on the face of the infinium. In both cases, the input capacitance is about eight picofarads. For DC, this looks like an open circuit, so the input impedance of our scope is one mega ohm or 50 ohms. But as frequency goes up, the impedance of the capacitor goes down. So at what point does the impedance of the capacitor equal the impedance of the resistor in magnitude? Let's take a look at that on the next page. The impedance of a capacitor is one over J omega C. In this case, we're talking about C equal to C in. And the magnitude of that would just be one over omega C in. But when does that equal to the value of R in? We're just gonna equate those two. So this term equals this term bring the R in over here and the omega over here, and so we have that omega is one over R in C in. Divide by two pi, and we have the frequency where that's true. If you had a one mega ohm resistor and eight picofarads, this frequency would be about 20 kilohertz. And what that means is that if you're operating at a frequency less than 20 kilohertz, the input impedance of the scope is about one mega ohm. Depending on the Thevenin resistance, we could have little or no effect. So if we're measuring a high Thevenin resistance circuit, this could still be troublesome. We're gonna look at using an oscilloscope probe to actually improve on this. Most of the time we're measuring circuits with Thevenin resistances that are very small. We'd see very little loading effect. If you were to make the input resistance 50 ohms, but again, eight picofarads, we're looking at this equation giving us about 400 megahertz. So in other words, the input impedance of the scope looks like about 50 ohms when we're operating at frequencies below 400 megahertz. We're gonna use this for high frequency circuits and also for matching transmission lines. What about Z in of our digital multimeter? It too has several modes, one of which again is DC. Here it usually means direct current, although we are directly coupling to the meter. And it too has an R in and a C in. Depending on the scale that you're in, R in can be 10,000 mega ohms. This would be on the 200 millivolt, two volt scale and 20 volt scale. Now if you go on the higher voltage scales, it drops to 10 mega ohms. And still in both cases, this is much bigger than our oscilloscope. The value of C in is about 30 picofarads. So we can again calculate a frequency range where our input impedance is just a very high resistance. Let's next take a look at some equivalent circuits of common things we have in lab, and maybe the first one is the function generator we used in the last experiment. We saw that we could generate sine waves, triangle waves, ramps, square waves, and many more wave shapes. But besides that, we can also add a DC level to each of those waveforms. And then lastly, there is a Thevenin resistance associated with the function generator, and it's equal to 50 ohms. Now this is stuck here intentionally so that we can balance a transmission line. If you open up the function generator, and I don't recommend that you do this, you would actually see a physical 50 ohm resistor. Now we're all familiar with batteries, and they too have a Thevenin equivalent circuit. So for a one and a half volt battery, we have a voltage, but that's typically a little bit bigger than one and a half when it's fully charged. It's also a Thevenin resistance, and for a D cell, that would be about 100 milliohms. For a C cell, about 200 milliohms. For an A cell, about 400 milliohms. For a AAA cell, about 600 milliohms. And for a nine volt battery, around two ohms. We're gonna measure the Thevenin resistance of a D cell battery. Now, if you were to cut the battery open, and again, I don't recommend that you do this, you won't see a physical resistor inside of the battery. This really represents, in a sense, the amount of current that you can draw. If you were to put a short circuit across the battery, and again, you wouldn't want to do this, the most current that you could draw would be V sub S divided by R sub S. But typically, we have loads here, and some can be low impedances or resistances, and that will again form a voltage divider with this value of resistance. Now, as the battery ages, this value of V sub S starts to lower, at the same time, the value of R sub S starts to increase. We're gonna be looking at 
using a microphone in several of the experiments in this course, one of which is a dynamic microphone, and it too has a Thevenin equivalent with a Thevenin voltage and a Thevenin resistance. If you were to look inside the microphone, again, I don't recommend to take it apart, you would not see a physical resistor. This represents, again, the amount of current you can draw depending on the value of the voltage. Now, if you speak at normal levels, the value of V-mic for a dynamic microphone is about 100 microvolts peak to peak, and the Thevenin resistance would depend on the type of microphone it is, but somewhere in the 30 ohms to 1000 ohm range. There's other microphones, one of which is called a crystal microphone, where this voltage is much, much larger. And it's really putting the voice pressure wave onto a piece of crystal material, which can create very large voltages, but you can't get a lot of energy out, so the Thevenin resistance is much higher. You might use this kind of a microphone in a parabolic dish to try to pick up maybe sounds in a stadium. Now, how can we measure a source resistance? Well, we have an ohmmeter. Suppose you put an ohmmeter across the terminals of a Thevenin equivalent circuit. Well, that ohmmeter is going to try to pump a current through here and then measure the voltage across here and then take the ratio. But because this voltage is here, that's going to cause the voltage here to be different than the voltage across the sample. So we actually get a false reading. Measuring the Thevenin resistance, we really have two unknowns here, the voltage and the resistance. So we probably need two data points to be able to calculate one or both. Suppose that we take our resistance and we measure its value very accurately with our digital multimeter and stick it in this circuit. So the rise in voltage then would equal the drop across here plus the drop across here. And the current that flows in here is going to be a current we'll call I sub RL1. My rise in voltage would equal the drop. Now I have things I can measure. So I can measure this and I can measure this. I'm going to do that by measuring the voltage and then calculating the current. So here are my two unknowns and I have one equation of those two unknowns. Now I'll take a second resistor and do the same thing again. Measure its value and then hook it up in this circuit. And again, I have the same equation. The rise in voltage would equal the drop across this resistor plus the drop across R sub L2. And that's this expression. And again, we could measure this voltage and we could then calculate this current knowing the resistor. Now we have two equations and two unknowns and we can solve then for either or both of the quantities. Now they both have V sub S on the left hand side of the equation. Let's equate those two and then solve for the value of R sub S, which is our Thevenin resistance. So then we have I sub RL1 times R sub S plus V sub RL1 equal to I sub RL2 times R sub S plus V sub RL2. Let's put all the things that multiply R sub S on one side of the equation. So here's I sub RL1, and then from the other side of the equation, a minus I sub RL2, and then put this on the other side. So we get a minus V sub RL1. Now let's solve for R sub S. So it's this term here divided by this term, and I pulled a minus sign out here so that these two are the same subscripts. We're going to use the voltmeter to measure the current by measuring the voltage across the resistance. So we can just substitute in our Ohm's law relationship. Thevenin resistance is the change in voltage over the change in current with a minus sign. In ECE 201, we talked about switches. Let's take a little bit of a review of that. A toggle switch is just that. It just toggles between two circuits. Now the arm or the part of the switch that's moved to open and close the circuit is referred to as a pole. And the throw is the number of circuits that it connects. That's a pretty formal definition, but it might be easier to look at a picture. So here's a single pole, single throw switch. Here's the pole, and here's part of a circuit and part of a circuit. And when we close this, we then connect up one circuit. So single pole, single throw. Here's, again, a single pole, but now we're going to hook up two circuits. So when the switch is in this position, we hook up this circuit. We move the switch to this position, we hook up this circuit. Single pole, double throw. Here's a case of double pole, single throw. So here's a single pole single pull. They're actually tied together, so when you flip the switch, we're going to connect up this circuit, connect up this circuit, but they're not connected to each other in general, although they can be. This would be a double pull, double throw. Here's our pull, connecting up one circuit, throw it, throw both these simultaneously, and hooking up this second circuit. In lab, we're going to use a solderless board to be able to build a circuit quickly and then also disassemble it quickly. Here's a thing called a proto board. It's also called a solderless board. There's a picture of it here. A lot of BNC connectors allowing us to connect in our cables into our circuit and then take things back out again. What's below here is a sketch of this, kind of labeling the holes and explaining a little bit what they mean. Let me zoom on this a little better view. There's a, there's a row here which has five holes and these are all shorted together. So that green line means that these are all the same. Likewise, over here, this pinkish line has the connection where all five of these holes are actually connected together. What that allows you to do is say, take a resistor, and all of these rows are the same. They're just shorted together, but they're not shorted to each other. So we're going to put a resistor in this hole, 
and bring it over here. Then I could hook up four more things to this resistor and four more things to this side of the resistor. Now the width of this channel between these two sets of rows is about the width of an integrated circuit. And we're going to stick an op amp between those two and then make connections with four more for each of the connections of the op amp pins. So we've got about 64 rows like this here, okay, just going back and forth, that are all shorted together in groups of five, but not shorted to each other. Now sometimes you need to have more connections than just four. So these lines on top is another option where all of these holes are shorted together. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So 50 holes shorted together. Same is true for this next row. And there's several more of these down here. We call these bus strips where we have lots of connections coming to one point. This might be the positive power supply plus pin or perhaps a minus pin of a negative power supply. And also on these boards, we've connected the negative terminal, the chassis of the frame, and we're going to make that through our VNC connector and also our connection to the ground. The purpose of this lab is to take a look at some of the techniques of measuring Thevenin and resistance. We're also going to use a proto board or a solderless board for quick assembly and disassembly of our circuits without needing to solder. The concepts that are covered are the accuracy of the infinium, and this will be actually in the lab part itself, measuring source resistance in linear circuits, pulls and throws of switches, battery performance and characterization, some of which is in the lab itself, and microphone characterization. Some of the lab techniques we're going to cover are the use of the Infinium's toolbar to measure peak-to-peak -peak voltages. We're going to reprogram the function generator's calibration for what are called high impedance loads. And lastly, we're going to measure DC voltages with a digital voltmeter. Now, before you come to lab, I'd like you to read the lab itself, and you'll have a quiz at the beginning of this lab that's going to cover this lab lecture, the video that goes along with it, and the lab experiment itself. And this is lab number two.